the company we buy it from actually supplies the International Space Station. You just open the cover of the unit, turn the power on, and you should instantly see it come on. A lot of carbon filters are granulated, activated carbon. The filters that we use are solid carbon block filters. When they've tested it, they said they were dropping it off a two-story building and it bounces a couple times and they plug it in and run it again. listening to the GHT Overland Podcast. What are the top three requirements for living? You may or may not be asking yourself today, number one is air. The estimated time we can go with that air is three minutes. Coming in at number two is water. We cannot go without water for more than three days. And food is number three. The human body has an estimated three weeks capacity without food. So as you look at your overland gear and setup and you're wondering, What are my most important things to cover? Water is going to come in at number one. Let's assume air is taken care of in our normal overlanding conditions. Because if not, we have a serious problem to make number two and number three and beyond non-relevant. Good, clean, safe water might either be assumed by all of us, or take it for granted for after we've lived in houses for a lifetime. Water, even in the most remote wilderness, if not flowing directly out of the ground as a small little babbling brook, I become the water snob of all water snobs. After years in search and rescue, I've seen some very unsanitary things in which most people downstream are 100% convinced that that water is pure and amazing drinking water. I'll save you the details, but having actual clean water, free of pathogens or other microscopic floaties, has been at the top of our list for some time. So this week, we tackle our number one requirement as overland travelers, H2O, agua, the liquid of life, water, We've been asking every guest since we started in late 2017, how much water do you carry? How do you filter your water if needed? And you've heard all of those answers. We've been researching how we should plan for sourcing and filtering our water, hopefully mitigating those required trips into town or campground. We've been stockpiling those ideas and filtering all the options to what we feel is the best option for us. What we were looking for was a rugged, reliable solution to filter and purify water, along with the ability to pull water from either a pristine glacial creek or a murky pond, if that's our only option. Literally, there's nothing more important than water. As we reach our final weeks before our full-time escape into the wildest of places, we have a sweet episode this week with Guzzle H2O a local company in Oregon making water sourcing, filtering, and purifying kits right in our home country of the USA. Get your earbuds nuzzled in as we discover water sourcing, filtering, and purifying from two men who have made it their mission to provide a better solution for you and I to get clean, safe water during our overland adventures. Much like ditching plastic bags, We can now ditch those plastic water bottles and mysterious water from mysterious gas station water hoses. As a bit of an introduction, Doogie, who is a professional bowman for several sailboat racing teams, that's right, he races those fancy 
sailboats you only see on TV. He became fed up with all the trash and recycling bins frequently spilling over with those water bottles. Partnering with his good friend Tyler, they've cracked the code on convenient, reliable water sourcing and purifying, affordable and designed to integrate into existing systems, or as a turnkey solution if, like us, you're building an overland lifestyle in the wild backcountry and foreign countries with questionable water sources. Guzzle H2O is definitely worth your time to check out. Pure water, no trash, coming up after a few points of wisdom from Lisa. Be sure to tag us on the social medias so we can see what kind of awesomeness you're up to. Hashtag GHT Overland. This episode is brought to you by GHT Overland. Please keep in mind, we'd love your support. Keeping all the algorithm spirits happy is kind of necessary. So if you wouldn't mind... At minimum, Level 1 Love is taking a second to leave a rating on iTunes or the podcast platform you listen on. Anything from a short little I like it to whatever you're feeling. Without constant love from you, we're just sludge at the bottom of a lost cold coffee cup. Level 2 Love is found on ghtoverland.com. This is where we maintain a list of recommended apps, books, and gear. Thank you to everyone who has used these links. This also helps us earn a commission, costing you nothing extra. Level 3 Love is on Patreon. This is your opportunity to support the GHT Overland podcast with monthly little thank yous that help us pay web hosting fees, podcast hosting, and all the things that keep the podcast growing and improving. This is also how you get your hands on some sweet swag. Thank you for joining us as we pursue a renewed life mission of putting the best in people and nature on display while tackling the ugly Goliath of today by consistently placing positivity and respect for others in front of everything else. All right, Doogie and Tyler, welcome to the GHT Overland Podcast. We really appreciate you guys taking the time this morning to join us. And I got to be honest, water anxiety is a real thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a real thing, you know, not only in overlanding now, but in day-to-day life, you know, we... Exactly. You know, we'll talk about this more later, but, you know, we have quite a few customers that buy our product so, so they can go camping, but also they have a backup when there's a a boil load or notice or, you know, a natural disaster. And we have quite a few customers in Texas who have, you know, bought it for exactly that reason to just be ready on, you know, they can go camping and overlanding. They're stoked with that. And then if there's a hurricane rolling through and they got a boil load or notice for a week, they can use our system and, you know, they're pretty at ease. Oh, true. I didn't even think about that. That's a really good point. So without getting too far into the weeds, can each of you give us like a little background on yourselves and how Guzzle H2O came about? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll get started on that one. Um, I am uh, or was slash still am a professional sailor. Um, That's my my, my day job. Um, And, you know, we're we're out sailing and uh, a lot of the work I do is out in the med. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, you know, we're sailing, we're sailing these teams and, you know, some of the teams are, we have, you know, 15, 20, 30 people working on these teams. Um, in the summer in the med, it's pretty hot and people are drinking a lot of water. And, you know, if you say each person is drinking, you know, three liters of water a day, you know, on the being conservative and the bottles, the waters are coming in plastic bottles at, you know, half a liter each. So, you know, it's six bottles per person. Uh, you multiply that by 20 or 30 and then say you're there for 10 days. Um, you know, that it's just, you know, phenomenal the amount of water that you're going through and the, the garbage we're producing recycled or not, uh, it's just a huge amount of, of waste. And, um, I basically wrote a rant on Facebook saying, this is ridiculous. We should, you know, there should be a rule that bans this, you know, let us, you know, if, if we, there's a rule that bans it, we'll come up with a better solution. And, uh, and basically Tyler came to me and said, 
well, you know, why don't we be the ones to provide a solution? And we'd done a few other projects sailing related before that. Uh, so we'd worked together before. And, um, and so we started, you know, working on some ideas and sketches and prototypes. And, uh, and then we kind of grew from there. That's awesome. So we originally heard about you guys from a past guest, uh, Lee and Steph from Grizzly and Bear. And I think that was probably a little bit over a year and a half ago. So clearly we logged that into permanent memory because I was so impressed with what you had come up with um, for the time we were ready to complete our setup. Um, Water is obviously a very essential part of living. Uh, Clean, safe water keeps the trip obviously more enjoyable so you're not uh, having any um, gut issues if you drink bad water. Let's say in Mexico is the first place to come to mind. And we've looked at a lot of different options, but keep coming back to your system simply because the filter through the carbon and the UV is really interesting to me. I'm not the water filter expert, and there's a lot of lot to unpack here. Can we start with why do we need the, the carbon and the UV? Should we just get one or the other? Like, can you help me out there? Yeah, so I, I can talk about that. Um, I mean, basically the, you know, starting with the, problem that you know doogie was experiencing with his uh sailing teams just you know using uh bottled water i mean the reason you use bottled water is because you know it's safe and you know it uh is going to taste good and the chemicals have been removed and so um basically we you know our standard is we've got to make you know accessing you know any fresh water source for drinking water as convenient as using bottled water and so that means you got to absorb any chemicals that are making the water taste bad. And, um, carbon is the best way to do that. And so all of our systems use, uh, an activated carbon block filtration, um, as, uh, actually is the middle stage. I mean, on the portable system, there's a pre-filter, which is the first stage. And then, um, sort of the thing that, you know, unlocked power of our systems is the led UV technology. Um, which basically makes the, you know, the power of UV and eliminating bacteria, protozoa, and viruses in a way that um, is not a mechanical filter. So it's not reducing the water flow. And so you don't need um, a lot of pressure to move the water through and it doesn't clog. It's just a really strong, portable way to um, make sure nothing in the water is going to make you sick, which is, you know, sort of the, the other thing you need to have a super reliable source of drinking water so yeah i mean that's basically all of our our portable systems and our built-in systems all work on you know the combination of that carbon filter removing chemicals and bad taste and making the water taste good um and the uv to to kill any you know bugs that are going to make you sick so and really the you know having water that tastes good is as important as um you know, water that's safe because if the water doesn't taste good, you know, nobody's going to want to drink it anyway. And you, you know, people are going to end up dehydrated just from not wanting to drink the water. So. Totally makes sense. Like are all carbon filters equal or are there different uh, quality levels of carbon filters? Yeah. So good question. Um, There is a range of carbon filters. Like a lot of carbon filters are granulated activated carbon. And so in those filters, the carbon is, it's a much looser construction. So the pores are larger, doesn't have as much surface area to um, absorb chemicals. So the filters that we use are solid carbon block filters. And so that packs as much carbon into a small space. And so again, building a product that is supposed to be portable and ready to go anywhere the more um, filtration and chemical absorption you can pack into a small space is, you know, was, was interesting to us. So that's why we um, use that technology. So we source our carbon block filters from a company in um, Las Vegas. So those come from the U S um, and then the UV system is also built in the U S by a company in Kentucky. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. And I love the fact that you guys are, is it hood river? I know you're in the in the gorge. Yeah, that's that's correct. We just we're in the Columbia River Gorge. Uh, we it's awesome. We basically the last few years have been working out of our own garages, and so we just uh, opened up a manufacturing facility over in White Salmon, which 
is in a different state, but it's five minute drive from both of our houses. So that's cool. So Tyler, how often um, and when will I know when I need to change out the carbon filter? Yeah. So carbon filters are rated for either six months of use or a thousand gallons. Um, and so in for mo- what most people are doing with our systems, they are hitting the six month time limit before they're getting to a thousand gallons. Got it. The other way you're going to know it's time to change your filter is just if you sucked up, you know, if, if it's done a lot of work collecting sediment out of your water, um, the you'll see a reduced flow rate. And that is a sign that um, it is time to change the carbon filter. That makes sense. Yeah. So then on the, the filters, if someone ends up being in a very remote place and I'm not able to, let's say, order a new filter from you on the web or wherever that might be, what are my options to be able to get that filter replaced? Yeah, so we've done our best to, you know, make our system field serviceable and and not have too many proprietary, you know, fittings that you can't find around the world to to service the system should it break down. And, and including the carbon cartridge is, it's just a standard five inch um, carbon cartridge. So you can find those internationally. Like, I mean, if, like I said, we believe we sell the best ones we can source, um, but you can order them on Amazon or in the States, you can find them at Home Depot. Um, as you go around the world, it's, I'm not exactly sure where to tell you to find one, but definitely it's, um, it's a commonly available item. So. Okay, cool. So I think I've got this right. So the carbon filter is going to take out the, the sediment and make the, um, the water taste good. And then it, when you go to the UV purification, that's going to kill any of the bad bugs that would upset my stomach, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, so the carbon <laughs> okay. is a very well-known method of filtering water. And so for us, it's doing two things. Well, so, and actually to back up one step, there is a pre-filter on the intake line. So that's getting any large pieces of sediment, but anything that gets through the pre-filter and that's the pre-filter is something that you can um, clean off in the water. So if it accumulates a bunch of mud or, or leaves and whatnot, you can, um, you just shake it off in the water and it, all the um, sediment will slough off and you continue to filter. Uh, the carbon filter physically screens out anything larger than 0.5 microns. And so it stops any sediment that um, would uh, create turbidity or, you know, just be particulate matter in your water. Um, And then, so sort of a a second process, that's just the um, chemical nature of carbon is it's got open bonds that grab on to um, smaller chemicals that are in the water, like VOCs or metals and, you know, chemicals that are in the water, the, the open bonds of the carbon grabs on and, and the chemicals stick to the carbon. So it's, it's got a lot of surface area in its chemical structure to be able to absorb chemicals like that. So, so the carbon has, you know, first the physical screening of particles larger than 0.5 micron, and then this chemical ability to attached to um, chemical molecules that are that you don't want in your water. Okay, cool. So on that covers like, I think, does that cover everything on the carbon filter that uh, people should know? One of the reasons we use it in that way is because we want the water by the time it's getting to the UV, that it's clean and clear. And, you know, if the, if the water is not clear and going into the UV, basically the UV is not that effective. And so by going at a half micron uh, carbon system, we're making sure, you know, there's clear water. Because you see a lot of the, you know, the portable UV systems uh, that are out there. But, you know, they don't, if your water is not clear to start out with, then, you know, it, they're not as effective. And so the carbon is allowing our UV to work, you know, very effectively. I think, Chris, I think the one other thing I would point out is that, um, a lot of times people are using our portable system as well as the built-in systems this applies to you. Like you might not necessarily be sourcing water out of a lake or a river or something like that. You might be filling up, you know, at home in, you know, Portland or Seattle or Los Angeles where 
they've added a lot of chlorine to the water. And so that is something that makes your water, um, you know, not as delicious as it could be. So carbon is a very common, I mean, it's built into the refrigerator filters that, you know, most of us have in our homes and most, you know, a lot of people are using at home to make their drinking water taste good. So, so the carbon is as much about, you know, targeting chemicals and bad taste that you're getting from urban water supplies as much as it is uh, at targeting, you know, sediment and chemicals that you might find in natural sources. So does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. I do have one other question. One thing that I'm very used to doing is trying to find a good stream to get water out of. Usually I find if I'm getting water out of a lake, even after filtering it, it's going to taste a little fishy. Yeah. With using your system, is that going to, are you able to mitigate that or is that something you just can't get around? Yeah, no, I mean, our experience is that it usually tastes, you know, tastes really good. Um, the, I mean, that, you know, it's hard to say what you are using for a filter in that case, but um, most of the hollow fiber products actually don't do any chemical absorption. So, so they don't have any benefit of, um, you know, eliminating bad taste. So that, you know, could be what you're looking at. I mean, a lot of times they pair they will put a small amount of carbon in like a hollow fiber inline filter. Um, but again, I think the game is to, you know, carbon is all about the surface area and, you know, with how much bad taste and chemicals it can absorb. Whereas the hollow okay. fiber uh, just has, you know, very little chemical absorption capacity, you know, basically none. So it's, I mean, that's, uh, you know, just small fibers that it forces the water. Like, it's just a, a physical screen as opposed to any kind of chemical absorption properties. Okay, cool. And then how long should we expect the UV um, LED to work? And then when do we know when that needs to be replaced? Yeah, so the UV is an LED-based system, which... Um, again, is one of the things that unlocks the, you know, compact size of our system because it uh, is a very low power consumption and it's very small itself. It is rated for 10,000 hours. So it's an LED bulb. So it's similar to, you know, any of the um, light bars you might have on your truck or, you know, other LED lights that have a very long lifespan. So and that's 10,000 hours of runtime. Doogie, what did we, you worked out. So, how many yeah. So that is. Yeah. So 10,000 hours is basically, well, 416 days. So that is if you're running, if you're filtering water nonstop, 416 days, 24 hours a day. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's, that's an awful lot of water. <laughs> so we, I mean, we basically regard that as maintenance free, especially relative to, you know, existing UV products, um, which are usually based around, you know, glass tubes. I mean, if you even forget about the power requirements to run a conventional UV, the glass bulbs that um, supply the UV light in conventional UV systems are extremely fragile and they uh, heat up the water quite a bit. And so that leads to a lot of chemicals bonding to the glass. And so you end up with, you know, I don't know exactly what the um, maintenance cycles are on those, but it's, you know, it's a matter of uh, hundreds of gallons. So you end up doing a lot of maintenance on a conventional UV system, whereas the LED-based system is essentially maintenance-free. Okay, that makes sense. How do we know when it needs to be replaced or how do we get it replaced? Is that something you can get uh, around the world or is that something that needs to be ordered directly back from Guzzle H2O? Yeah, so... There's one of the things we built into the system is a way to visually verify that the UV is on. There's a clear section of tubing inside the unit where you've got to take it like inside a tent or inside a vehicle where it's, you know, not direct sunlight, but you can, you can physically see the, um, the UV light working. So that's your confirmation that, you know, we suggest everybody does beginning of a trip or, you know, just check doing your, you know, regular maintenance routine, just inspect that the UV light is working and it's, you just open the, the cover of the unit of the stream unit, turn the power on and you should instantly see it come on. So it's, it's a real easy check to do. Um, as far as replacing, it's intended to be maintenance free. 
it's not really something that's able to be done in the field. Like, so your, your stream would have to come back to us, but you know, one of the reasons we use this particular UV unit is it's extremely robust. Um, they actually, so the company we buy it from actually supplies the international space station with, um, for their water reclamation system. And so, you know, we figure if it's rugged enough to go on the space station, we should be able to send it, you know, around the world and not have too many problems. So we've seen some videos from them that when they've tested it and they, so they were dropping it off a two story building and it bounces a couple of times and then they plug it in and run it again. Wow. No kidding. You, can, you look in there and you see the UV. So that's the unit directly with no case or protection or anything. Um, you, know, you know, we're providing quite a bit of protection to the unit before, you know, if it does get dropped. I think that gives us a lot of confidence in what you've been able to put together. That's really awesome. Yeah. I, one thing I'd want to point out is the way the LED UV is a, is a bit of a game changer for UV purification for, for overlanding and especially, you know, on vehicles, obviously, because it, um, first of all, the LED is really low power draw. And then it also, it's only turns on instantly. Like it senses the water move when you open your faucet on your, you know, built in onboard water system. And so it is only consuming power when you're actually running the faucet. And so that is a, you know, an important thing for, you know, any vehicle based installation because, you know, it, it, it only draws, I think nine Watts of power when it's on and it's only on when it's ac you're actually running the faucet. So. Let's go through some of the different options you've got. I was going through your, your website. There's quite a few different things there. The portable options listed on the website are the stream and the spigot. What are the differences between those two? Yeah, the spigot I'll start with, I guess, is actually something where we've kind of discontinued and we're still working on it. It's one of the original iterations um, of the stream, basically before we added a pump to it. So, um, but this, so the way I would think of our product line is, yeah, the portable systems and then, which is the stream line, and then all the stealth products are made to be built into a vehicle. So on the stream side, you know, obviously the stream in its hard case is the core product. And then we've got some accessories such as the 30 foot outlet hose, just to allow you to, you know, for overlanding to park your vehicle a safe distance away from the water and be able to pump water out of a lake, the safe distance to your truck and fill up the onboard tank. So, uh, and then we're actually coming out with a new pre-filter that is a little more um, robust pre-filter for silty water situations to help expand the life of the carbon filter. So that's kind of the portable side. We've also got a few accessories for keeping it charged. Like we have some rafting customers who take the stream out on multi-day trips. And so they need a way to recharge the system. So we build um, extra batteries and uh, we are a goal zero dealer, so we can um, supply some portable power stations and solar panels to provide you with a way to keep the, the stream system charged on a you know multi-day trip if you don't have a, a vehicle that you're taking along. Okay, cool. So the stream system is going to be the one that's going to be portable. I can take that down to a river or a lake. And then you've got several different options on the built-in point of use system. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so the, the stealth lineup is, um, again, it's the same carbon block filtration with the uh, LED UV purifier. And sort of the original most popular model is the standard stealth. Um, and that's great for like a sprinter van sort of a, uh, setup, any van build out. It's great for campers. From there, we've kind of, you know, as we've done this over the last years, we've seen a bunch of different use cases where, you know, there's more space. And so we developed the Stealth 2x10, which gets you a little bit more flow rate with um, larger filter canisters. Uh, and then we've also just split off just the UV function. If somebody has, um, you know, application where they, you know, they've already got a filter system uh, built in, they can add the UV as a standalone item. And then same thing with the carbon filtration. If you just want to add a filter, we offer the Stealth Carbon, um, which comes in either the five inch filter or the 10 inch filter. Okay, cool. So that's some really good flexibility. 
based on what somebody already has. The Stealth yeah. 2 by 10 if you've got those two 10-inch filters, how much more water will that filter, or is it only giving you a bigger flow rate? So it is, the Stealth 2 by 10 is still, is it's actually rated at the same fl flow rate as the standard Stealth, but, but in practice, the larger filters let more water through with this, you know, for a given pump size. And basically adding a pre-filter in front of your carbon filter extends the life of your carbon filter. So you're basically getting, you know, more water filtered to a more robust level. So in a larger vehicle, if you've got, you know, larger water tanks or you're trying to run the water to a shower, having you know, filters that aren't quite so restrictive is a good thing because, you know, for something like a shower, you, you want a little bit of water pressure um, going to that. So that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And the pre-filter you talked about that you're coming out with, any ideas on uh, when that's going to be available for people? Those are, um, those are available now. We, we haven't got it up on the website, but um, it's something okay. we're using. And uh, so I don't know. The, Certainly by the end of March, it's going to be up on the website. So, yeah. Okay, cool. couple of random questions. I'm guessing the Overland Bundle will be one of the most interesting to our listeners. Can you give us the basic rundown of that system and how, I think you said 30 feet that it'll pump water from. So if water isn't like safely accessible right next to the rig. Yeah, yeah. so the... The Overland bundle basically includes, you know, you have your 30 foot hose and extra uh, carbon block filter. And um, so in the 30 foot hose is, you know, a pretty popular add on. So that, yeah, like Tyler said, you can park at a safe distance away. Um, and basically you put the whole stream unit, you know, pretty close to the water with the six foot uh, inlet hose. And then you connect your 30 foot out hose and it allows you to park, you know, safely, not close to the river bank or you know we've done it where you basically parked on the side of the highway and there's a river uh running at the bottom of the highway just off the shoulder and you kind of you know able to pump the water up to uh up to the the camper that way so i i would i guess the thing i would add and point out is that one of the things that sets the stream apart from some of the other products that are out there is it's got the battery built into it and so it turns out that if you're trying to you know, move water any sort of distance, it works much better to pump it as opposed to pull it with suction. So having the battery built into the stream means that you can bring the whole case over and you don't need to run cables back to your truck to hook up to the, you know, your truck's 12 volt system. It makes the system much easier to use, you know, especially in the scenario where you're like, like we said, trying to move the water some distance. Uh, over to a, to a vehicle. The design philosophy that, uh, you know, Tyler and I have had from the beginning is, you know, and we, we started, you know, we, we want to make it environmentally uh, correct or friendly, you know, trying to reduce the use of plastic water bottles. Part of that is our system needs to be easier to use than going to the grocery store and buying water because that's what everybody's been doing and everybody's used to that. If our system is easier to use, then people will naturally gravitate towards a better system anyway. And so that's why like in the, in the stream, the batteries included, the pumps included, it's all in there. It's all inside and you put it next to the river and you push one button and it does everything. Um, so, you know, there's no, you know, you know, running out, hooking up an external battery or there are other systems out there where you got to run, you know, a power cable directly to, you know, the hood of your car to, sorry, to the battery under the hood of your car. So all that gets pretty labor intensive. And as people start looking at that, they're like, this is getting pretty difficult, pretty complicated. I'm just doing it at the store and, you know, I'm going to buy, you know, 20 gallons of water jugs and call it good. And so by including everything in this, in the box and, you know, trying to make it as simple as possible, which we feel that we've gotten pretty close to where basically all you have to do is put the internet next to the water and push one button and off you go. And that all of a sudden, becomes more tempting to use than having to go to the grocery store, haul your, you know, 40 bottles of water, move them around and load them in your truck. Well, yeah. And you could save a ton of weight by not having to carry all those around. It looks like a really well put together system. And I love the box 
that it's in, it looks very robust. So that thing's banging around in with all the other gear. Um, it just keeps everything nice and condensed and easy to use. You just pull it out and it's an absolutely brilliant idea. Very well thought out. We've worked, you know, really hard to make it, you know, durable. I mean, it is in the back of my truck, you know, all the time rattling around back there. And probably the person that wants to use it the most is my now 10 year old son. So it has been, you know, used and abused uh, heavily. Actually at the beginning of COVID, right before the whole shutdown, we, me and my family were in Africa uh, doing a camping overlanding trip. And we were using that for as our sole source of, you know, getting clean water. And, you know, it pretty, you know, we put it in our check luggage and, you know, flew it out there and then used it for the two and a half weeks that we were camping and then, you know, put it back in our luggage and flew home with it. And it, you know, it, it had a pretty rough life in the back of the truck for those two weeks. <laughs> I bet it did. Uh, you know, on some really rough gravel roads in Namibia, uh, just for thousands of miles, um, you know, and, and it's still, you know, it's still the one I use. I've, we've had it for a couple of years now. Uh, it's one of the original streams and I still use it on a regular all the time. It's, it's, you know, that's, that's mine. Um, that's the one we use for the family. And, you know, we, I would say we treat it, you know, probably rougher than most people would, you know, because we feel that if it's going to break it, we want, we want it to break under our, our use. Um, and so, you know, we treat it, you know, it ha- it's had a rough life and still is having a rough life and it works just fine. That's awesome. Any other interesting use cases that you've uh, heard about people using your system? In the early days, we did a lot of product development where we were installing systems on boats because as Doogie said, the original idea was how do we um, support sailing teams that were going on the water. And so we built some pretty elaborate, you know, onboard drinking water systems for teams that were built out of, um, you know, small support boats, like inflatable rib boats. Um, and then we had, we built a, w- at least one in, in a multi-hull sailboat that um, I think ended up capsizing. And I think the only way they were able to, I mean, that was one of our early failures or not failures, but that one of our early systems that um, bit the dust because they flipped the trimaran over and the engine oil ran out and flooded the onboard plumbing system. And our filtration system was part of that. So so that's, you know, maybe one of the edge use cases I can think of. I don't know. We've definitely got, I mean, we've got a lot of people now building vans and uh, camping trailers, you know, that are doing some pretty elaborate installations. So, yeah, we have, we have quite a few, you know, pretty, you know, high profile um, build customers that, you know, repeatedly coming back, building, you know, these high end truck campers and, They've all been, you know, super satisfied with the system. You know, they order, you know, four or five or, you know, a dozen at a time. A month later, they're ordering again. So we usually take that as a pretty positive sign that, you know, they're happy with the system. You know, they are available for home installation. So we've got, you know, a lot of people with cabins where they have a, like a well water supply um, where they're installing the stealth stealth system and, you know, off-grid uh, living situations. Um, there's a couple of hunting camps that use our system to um, provide water for their guests at the hunting camps. So, Okay, super cool. One of the things we plan on doing is using a separate spigot just for the drinking water coming out of the system. Is that a good idea or is that a mistake to not just filter everything? No, that, that that's usually our, actually our preferred way of installation for the stuff okay. is that because, you know, you don't need to filter the water, you know, in for your shower or washing your hands and, you know, and so, you know, you're, you're, you're using a lot of resources to filter all that water. And so usually, so we like to be able to have basically like basically a, a separate spigot just for the drinking water that you're filtering. The other positive side of that is you're not running any, um, you don't, you're not running any clean water. Um, through your faucet that might get cross contaminated if you're if you're only filtering say the clean the cold water and not the warm water. Um, oh, if, if both, true. Both waters come out of the faucet, then there's possible some contamination at the you know right there at the faucet. Um, I, we have some customers that do that, and you know that's fine. Um, but our recommended preferred way to do it 
it's basically yeah, having your independent um, water spigot for just drinking or cooking. Okay, super cool. Anything that we've missed, guys? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I would think of the, you know, the, the stealth products are all about making sure your onboard water supply is, you know, is clean. And then the stream system is, is about, you know, how do you get water on board the truck, you know, when you're run out. And, and so if you use the systems together, you know, sort of back to the question of the single spigot or maybe a whole house system, if you're using the stream to fill up your truck, you're keeping the you know, the vehicle water supply pretty clean to start with. And then, you know, your onboard stealth system is both a backup source, backup ability to purify the water and just making sure nothing's getting funky inside your tanks, especially if you're in, you know, hot weather or something like that, where, you know, the, the whole truck, the interior of the truck is, is heating up, which, you know, promotes, promotes your tank getting, you know, more funky than, than not. So. Yeah, totally makes sense. It looks like the, and I like how you've put those bundles together. So it looks like the the expedition bundle for somebody that has got a built-in water system like we will have is kind of the way to go. So you can get it filtered coming from the stream and then uh, filtered again when you're actually using it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that that's your bulletproof system, you know, that you're, that's going to give you the most flexibility and be able to do just about anything and get water from anywhere. Um, you know, that's for sure the, the system that people are using when, you know, they're going out and, you know, not coming back for a while. Yeah. I mean, the, the other, I mean, it seems a little bit redundant to, you know, use a stream and a stealth system, but, you know, I think the way a lot of us are living these days where we're doing outdoor activities and the sort of the vehicle is sort of the base camp for, you know, whether like Doogie's going kiteboarding or, you know, he's going to the beach and he wants to refill his water bottle and he's got a water supply on board is, you know, his trailer or his camper or whatever, you know, the vehicle has sort of become the base camp for, you know, whatever activity you're doing for the day. And so, you know, might not be resupplying out in the field, but, you know, you've filled up the tanks at home and, and, you know, the water, uh, you want to know that the water coming out of the tanks is, is good drinking water. And so, so being able to have, you know, everything built in and, and a good, you know, base camp set up for whatever activity you're doing is a, is a great feature in, in these adventure vehicles that everybody's putting together. Well, I think it's brilliant. Um, we've been looking at it for about a year and a half and it's time to do something. Why don't you go through, if you would, and tell our listeners how they can learn more about your system and connect with you. So like your website, any social media you guys do. Yeah, so... The website is uh, just www.guzzleh2o.com, and that's the best place to find out about all our products. The best way to get a hold of us is to email info at guzzleh2o.com, or I think there's an online contact form, but definitely email is the best way to track us down. Probably our biggest social feed is Instagram, where you can you know see what's going on and, and hear about news from us on, on there. All right, very good. So we always close out each episode with uh, what is your favorite genre of music and do you play any instruments when you're out on the road? I do not play an instrument, at least not on purpose. <laughs> and uh, I would say, what do we play in the shop a lot lately? I would say it's, you know, there's a lot of 90s music going on and, some, you know, usually most alternative and rock is Tyler might have a wider uh Yeah, wider we're definitely uh, definitely children of the 90s, and so we're playing a lot of grunge music and a lot of, uh, um, you know, Pearl Jam, Nirvana, that kind of thing. I mean, I grew up on an island, you know, off, off of Seattle. So, um, yeah, definitely big grunge music fans, and I don't know, haven't moved too far from that, so... <laughs> uh, well, that's good. At least we know that if we stop by your shop, we've got some good music. Yeah. I mean, I, so I, I took piano lessons, uh, you know, at one point growing up and I think my piano career ended with, you know, getting halfway through the song on stage and forgetting the rest of it and standing up and walking off stage. So that, that's been my <laughs> level of music talent. That's great. And what's a favorite uh, beverage in the morning to get you going? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big coffee drinker. Yeah. There we go. And a favorite beverage at night to wind down after a long day in the shop? Well, Doogie rides his Peloton in that situation. <laughs> um, 
I would I would probably have uh, one of our local IPAs here in Hood River. Like, uh, love it. Yeah. I'm a heavy water drinker. That's awesome. <laughs> the big water drink. It's a perfect answer. All right, guys. Again, we really appreciate your time um, spending with us today and giving us the the inside view and what you've done. I think your system is just fantastic. So thank you so much for taking the time today. Yeah, awesome, Chris. Great. Good to talk to you, and thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. And hopefully we'll uh, hopefully we'll see you around at some of these uh, Overland shows this summer. Yeah. Do you plan on being at any of the expos? Yep, we're going to be at Overland West, uh, the Pacific Northwest Overland Expo, and then and then uh, we're doing a lot of the Adventure Van Expo events. So, yeah, come find us there. And then we will let you guys go. I'm sure you have a busy day. Uh, but again, thanks a lot. We really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Bye.